This is A New Angle, a show about cool people doing awesome things in and around Montana. I'm your host, Justin Angle. This show is supported by First Security Bank, Blackfoot Communications, and the University of Montana College of Business. Hey folks, welcome back and thanks for tuning in. Today's guest is Rick Ridgway, legendary alpinist, adventurer, activist, and writer. I've learned that paying attention is one of the deepest and most profound ways to really connect. And if there's any secret sauce, it's that one. Rick's new book, Life Lived Wild, is a fantastic collection of adventure essays told with a focus on the amazing relationships he forged through shared objectives and deep experiences. Rick will be in Bozeman on December 16th for an event with Conrad Anker at the Emerson Center. Rick, thanks for coming on the show today. Yeah, my pleasure uh, to join you guys, Justin. Great to be here. Yeah, so tell us, where did you grow up and what did your parents do? Well, I grew up in California uh, in a small uh, rural part of Orange County when Orange County near Los Angeles was still rural. It was a formative time for me. We were next to the Santa Ana Riverbed. It was in those years in the late 50s, early 60s, still undeveloped. And, you know, I I just, it resonated with me. I spent a lot of time in the groves, uh, in the riverbed with my buddy, with my single shot 22, hunting (laughs) for rabbits. Then my parents divorced and I followed my father up to Northern California for a couple of years and returned to Southern California to rejoin my mother. And just in those three short years, the whole place had changed. The riverbed was channeled. The wow. groves were plowed under. There were housing tracks everywhere. It was just exploding in development. And I retreated to the hills around the Los Angeles basin. You know, I, 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 I went there at first for solace, but then I just fell in love with the, the wildness of it. And it was what it was missing. And that's where it all started. That's where my connection to wild places and undeveloped lands and, and mountains, uh, it, it all had its origins there. You know, one of the things in, in your most recent book, Life Lived Wild, that, that stands out is this kind of question about distinguishing between matters of consequence and matters of inconsequence. And that seems to be a big theme of your writing, big theme of your work in general. Let's start there. What have you learned about the difference between those two things? Well, the distinction between those two things is connected directly to climbing experiences, mountaineering experiences, uh, especially one uh, when I was uh, 30 and I had an opportunity to join a team of uh, climbers, close buddies, including Yvonne Chouinard, the founder of Patagonia, to attempt a 25,000 foot peak in a remote section of eastern Tibet in the first year that the People's Republic of China opened to outside mountaineers. And coming down from having established a camp at the 20,000 foot level on this remote mountain, four of us, including Yvonne and another close friend of mine, Jonathan Wright, we triggered an avalanche. And we were swept down the side of the mountain, 1,500 vertical feet. And, you know, I have to kind of guess how long we were in that avalanche, but I think Justin had to be at least 60 seconds and I thought I was dead the Mm -hmm. whole time. I didn't think there was any way I was going to get out of it alive, but the avalanche slowed and I was only partially buried when it stopped and I was still alive, even though I was injured, but I soon realized not as seriously as my colleagues. And I soon realized that of the four of us, Jonathan was the most grievously injured and I tried to keep him alive giving him mouth to mouth and holding in my arms for about a half hour until he died. And, uh, and I went home and went into a, you know, a deep introspection, whether whatever the rewards I was getting out of this life as a mountaineer were worth the risks that were so palpably real to me. They were risks that had taken one of my best friend's life and nearly taken my own. Jonathan and I were more than just close friends. We were also professional partners. We were a writer photographer team. He was the photographer. I was the writer. We had a couple of projects in development at National Geographic. And one of them was a, an article on the then just recently established Mount Everest National Park in Nepal. And Jonathan's widow, his mother and father, 
asked me to go back to Nepal and, and finish that story for them. Hmm. And I was in Kathmandu on my way to the Everest region. And I saw this beautiful woman in the hotel lobby and I had the waiter send her a drink and we started chatting. We hit it off. I took her out to dinner. And that night I confessed to her that I was in this introspection, trying to figure out what I was going to do with my life. And I told her about Jonathan, the avalanche, his death. And, and she started crying and, and, th- and said it was so close to an experience she had. She was sailing with her husband, who was an adventurer like me, off the coast of New Guinea, when unbeknownst to them, an earthquake triggered a big tidal wave and it swept across the bay they were crossing and, and demolished their boat. And there were 13 people on board and of those 13, only two lived. The other survivor was not her husband. And we, we had made a deep connection. It wasn't that many months later that we got married. And we were married because through our mutual experiences facing the near death of ourselves and the death of people so close to us, we realized that both of us had kind of started to realize what in life is really most important and what we can just let go of, what we can laugh at. Uh, the things that commonly frustrate people were already seeming to frustrate us less than the other people around us. And shortly after we married, I was reading to her one of my favorite books, The Little Prince by Antoine de Saint-Exupéry, the French writer. And in there, there was this section where the little prince is arguing with the airline pilot who's crashed in the Sahara. <laughs> uh, you know, he's, he's t- telling him a, a story about, or he's asking him a, a question about why some flowers have thorns on them. And the pilot, who of course is Saint Exupery himself, who was a famous airline pilot, says, don't bother me, I'm trying to fix my airplane. Hmm. Um, don't you know this is a matter of consequence? And the little prince looks at him and goes, matter of consequence? You don't think that trying to figure out why some flowers have thorns is not a matter of consequence? And that became Jennifer and my shorthand. We used that whenever we were trying to ourselves decide whether something was important or not. Yeah. We would look at each other and say, do you think that's a matter of consequence? Indeed. I mean, it seems like the pursuit of mountain objectives helps you kind of distinguish between those two things. What is important to my objective, to moving forward? Why do you think it's so hard for human beings to to sort of navigate that distinction of what matters and what doesn't? I think the biggest culprit is the distractions that all of us have in our daily lives. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm just sitting here looking at my computer at the bottom of my screen is, you know, all my apps for my emails and my messages and, and my calendar, all the things in our lives that can distract us from really recognizing and thinking about things in our daily lives that are consequential and things that are not, you know, in, in addition to trying to take the lessons from those experiences to, as I just explained, distinguish matters of consequence from inconsequence. I, I've also tried in my life to learn how to really pay attention to what's going on around me to the little things that may just otherwise go unnoticed in, in our lives. And, and I've learned that paying attention is one of the deepest and most profound ways to really connect on a daily basis to our lives in a way that allows us to live our lives more in the moment than in the past or in the future. And if there's any secret sauce, it's that one. Yeah. Do you think that that sort of ability to be observant, to be present in the moment is um, maybe a piece of your longevity in in the mountains and being able to to not only engage in these uh, expeditions, be a good partner, but also come home safely? Yeah, absolutely. When I uh, give my talk at uh, in, in Bozeman, your hometown soon. Uh, Conrad Anker is going to be there to mm-hmm. introduce me. And he's one of my closest friends. And I've learned so much from him. I hope I've been able to pass a few lessons in return. But one thing we have in common with all older climbers that I know who have been in the game for a long time, 
you know, is that ability to really focus, to really pay attention, to manage the risks. And I talk about that in, in the book as well. And that's definitely a form, of course, of paying attention. Absolutely. It's, it's an essential part of um, being a mountaineer and a climber if you're going to survive as a mountaineer. Right. And you mentioned Conrad there, and he features prominently in the book and in your life. You have an account of an expedition you two were on in Queen, Queen Maudland. And the passage where you say that your expedition with Conrad was your first expedition experience with, quote, not a word of contention. And that stood out to me. Tell us, tell me about Conrad and why he was so, why he's so special as, as a partner in the mountains and in life. Well, certainly it was and still is his skill as an alpinist. And on, on that climb in Antarctica, um, I was along as a kind of a hanger on. I was directing and producing a television show for National Geographic that we uh, made of the climb. The, and it was the first experience in my life on an expedition with more than two people where for the full length of the trip, we never had a crossword the whole time. It right. was extraordinary. Later, I had another expedition uh, with Conrad uh, following on foot the uh, an endangered species of goat antelope called shiru across an uninhabited section in northwest Tibet where mm -hmm. we were following the migration. In the southern part of their range, the animals were being poached for their underwool, which was being woven into women's shawls that had become a fashion hit in Milan and Paris and New York. And, and the wildlife biologists were concerned that if the calving grounds weren't discovered and if the poachers were to get there first, that it might be game over for this already very endangered species. So they had never been able to find those calving grounds because it was so remote they couldn't get there. Sure. So I, you know, had this idea to follow the animals on foot. There was no way to um, resupply a trip like we proposed to do. And I had this idea to pull rickshaws. <laughs> so I tell the story because it's another example of a trip that was so enjoyable because all of us got along so well. For all of us, that trip turned out to be one of the most fulfilling and enjoyable of our lives because you know, it wasn't about us. It wasn't about us trying to get to the top of some peak. It was about us trying to use our skills to help a, a species uh, that was heading in the wrong way. And it worked. That to me still remains one of the most inspiring experiences in my career. And I hope it is for anybody that reads the book because it, it really shows you what you can do when, when you collaborate, when you have a good strategy, uh, when you are focused, when you keep going and never give up and, and it can work. We'll be back to my conversation with Rick Ridgway after this short break. A New Angle is supported by First Security Bank, Blackfoot Communications, and UM's College of Business. Access to capital, broadband, and education are three ingredients any community needs for success. Hey, this is Jeff Petticord, and you're listening to A New Angle. Welcome back to A New Angle. I'm speaking with legendary alpinist and activist Rick Ridgway about his new book, Life Lived Wild. Yeah, and, and in those attributes certainly would apply to your experience at Patagonia, working in environmental affairs for 15 plus years. I mean, talk about that organization and talk about the, the sort of relentless focus on working to solve the environmental problems of our age. Well, as probably most people listening to this know, um, Patagonia is in business to use its business as a agent for environmental protection. Mm -hmm. And that commitment to its mission, which very succinctly is to save our home planet, <laughs> that commitment comes directly from Yvonne Chouinard's experience as a climber in wilderness and wildness. That same experience over my life, often with him in those wild places, informed the way that I went about my business life, mm -hmm. you know, as well as my home life. So Patagonia's commitment to protect nature, 
to protect the environment, protect our home planet comes directly from the love of the home planet that is connected directly to having spent so much time in nature. And a lot of the operating principles of Patagonia are also rooted directly in that. Um, the company, of course, as most listeners know, uh, has a policy that's part of its actual articles of incorporation to tithe one percent of its sales uh, back to environmental NGOs working to conserve and safeguard our home planet. And, and we should we should we should note, Rick, it's one percent of sales, not one percent of profits, right? So that's it, right. It comes off the off the top line, no matter what happens in terms of overall performance. Exactly, Justin. Uh, and to date, it's a way north of a hundred million dollars that we've given back or the company's given back to environmental groups. Yeah, so Patagonia comes up a lot in class and oftentimes students sort of, they think of it as a bit of a unicorn, like doing its own thing and operating by its own rules. And you know, one of the key distinctions that um, I think propels a lot of its ability to do the things that you just enumerated is the fact that it's privately owned and the leaders are not beholden to shareholders, they're beholden to themselves and they're accountable to the employees and the customers. And it's been able to become a tremendously successful business, but kind of following a, a bit of a different ownership model. I know that growth has been uh, both, you know, been something that's hotly debated within the company. Talk about that ability to kind of control its own destiny and set its own metrics for success and failure. Well, uh, you're right. Uh, because it's a private company, uh, as Yvonne f has famously said, that that means we get to do whatever we want to do. Yeah. yeah. And what we want to do is uh, use the business to save our home planet. Mm -hmm. That's that's his commitment. Uh, so you're right. But there are some very important nuances to to that. And I might tell another story to illustrate my own opinion on that, that happened right after I joined the company. Within the first few weeks of becoming a full-time employee there in the early aughts, I inherited a, a proposal that uh, was already underway <clears throat> between Patagonia and of all people, the Ford Motor Company, when Ford had come to Patagonia with uh, the idea that they would take a hybrid that they had in development then called the Escape and they would brand it uh, Patagonia. Mm. And then in turn, they would give Patagonia all this marketing for its you know, environmental commitments. But clearly they wanted to do that because you know, they wanted to get on Patagonia's coattails. And I would have just assumed when I joined the company that the person I replaced in marketing would have just said no to that immediately. I thought about it a little bit and then I had an idea. And this is the idea I took to Yvonne. I said, hey, Yvonne, I, you know this Ford thing? Uh, and he goes, oh God, I heard about that. He says, why didn't we just tell those guys to forget <laughs> it in the first place? And I said, yeah, I know that's the obvious response, but I had another idea. What if we went to Ford and we said, um, listen, we'll, we'll do this. We'll, um, we'll co-brand with you on this, on this hybrid vehicle, uh, but you gotta, you got to join 1% for the planet. Mm. You, you have to give 1% of your sales, not just for the hybrid, but for the whole bloody works back to the planet. And if you want to be green, then this is the way you're going to be That's green. What it takes. And Yvonne smiled and he said, go for it. <laughs> <laughs> so I did. I went back to a high level executive that reported directly to the board. I pitched it to him. He took it to um, the board. And the board just said, no way, are you mm -hmm. crazy? <laughs> and, and laughed it off. And of course I knew, and Yvonne knew, that would be their reaction. Now I'm telling you this story because I thought it through a little more and I asked myself, why did the board say no? Well, the obvious answer is that 1% of their sales would have come right off of their bottom line and it would have been uh, contrary to the fiduciary responsibility right. of all the board members. So I thought that through a little more. And I realized that what if they had said yes, and because they had said yes, a very significant cohort of citizens and consumers started buying that car 
right. because they were giving 1% of its sales back to the environment. And not just that car, but all Fords, so that consequently the company would have been incentivized to maybe convert the entire fleet to hybrids. I realized that when you think through these things and you look down into the well, if you want to use that metaphor, there was a mirror down there at the bottom of it. And in that mirror was the reflection of me and everybody else, all of us in our roles as consumers, that if we rallied to change uh, our purchasing habits and supported the companies that were more environmentally responsible, just like Patagonia's customers do, then Patagonia's commitment to environmental protection would scale very, very fast. Yeah. Once you recognize that, then you also realize that the solution to that dilemma is really up to governments, that they have to pass policies that reward companies that are reducing the environmental footprint of their products and services. I think the most important policy any country in the world can make right now is introducing a price on carbon. <clears throat> if carbon were priced, then all companies making products and services would have the same level playing field and it would incentivize them to reduce the carbon emissions in their entire supply chain and value chain. And what would happen? Well, then when you went to Walmart to get a t-shirt, the t-shirt that was made with the lowest footprint on the environment would cost less than the t-shirt that was more harmful. Yeah. And every, everybody would buy that. Now, governments are only going to do that in turn if their civil societies force them to, because that's not immediately in the interest of the shareholders who are probably funding the governments, <laughs> at least in our system, they are. Rick, in our time remaining, I'd love to just touch on a couple other things, if you're willing. You know, you, your commitment to climate change goes well beyond um well, it's, it's, it, it just manifests in so many areas. You are actively engaged in the One Earth organization. Tell us about that organization, why it's important to you. I am the chair of a group called One Earth. OneEarth.org is our URL. And uh, it's an NGO that uh, has raised money to fund scientists to uh, go deep and in detail on how much uh, of our energy production needs to convert from fossil fuel to renewable, how much of our natural landscapes on planet Earth need to be protected or restored so that they are carbon sinks, uh, either preventing more emissions or under restoration, taking carbon already emitted in the air and pulling it back into trees and soil. And thirdly, how much we need to convert our food production system from industrial agriculture to regenerative protocols mm -hmm. to keep the planet to 1.5 degrees. And we've nearly completed that science. And the answer is that we can do this. The answer is that we already have all the tools in our box and all we have to do is scale the use of those tools to solve climate change. Uh, it's right in front of us. It's just a matter of taking what we already know how to do and do it more and do it better. It does seem like that execution, you know, it's one of the things that kind of, you know, and I've heard this from scientists, from activists, from communicators, that that it's less a question of if we can, it's more a question of will we, right? Will we execute on, on the solutions that are better available? And one thing we don't need to do, Justin, is go to Mars. Yeah, you know, yeah. I can't believe Bezos and Musk. I yeah. mean, where are those guys coming from? Well, the answer to my own question is that wherever it is they're coming from did not include any time in nature because neither of them seem to have any sense about how natural systems actually work. And because they don't have any understanding of this, that they have no appreciation for it. And it doesn't in return inform how they think about their own businesses and their businesses relationship to nature. It just astounds me um, that people that are that bright, who have the skills to create some of the, you know, 
highest functioning, most successful businesses on, on the planet don't understand that without a healthy planet that's providing healthy resources to their businesses, including clean air and clean water, they're not gonna have a business. As our mentor, David Brower said, there is no business on a dead planet, but I'm not gonna give up. We just, none of us can give up. We just have to keep the mantra going. Um, I just hope someday I can get on stage with those guys because I'd love to look them in the face and say, you know what, buddies, <clears throat> it's pretty easy following the tracks that you guys are on to turn Earth into Mars. But you know what? We're never going to turn Marth, Mars into Earth. Right, right. Um, in our time re remaining, Rick, just tell us, you know, what's kind of next for you? You've got this book out. You're, you know, you're still playing around in the mountains and engaging in these important topics. What, uh, what's next? What do you want to do next? Well, one thing I, I, I want to do is, is not travel as much as I used to. Yeah. <laughs> Pre-COVID, COVID's been a had a, a a remarkable silver lining for me in that it forced me to stay home and pay attention to my own backyard. Uh, just do more hiking uh, and uh, go on more excursions into the backcountry in Southern California where I live. And it's been a terrific revelatory experience for me. Um, every time, every day, this morning, I was out early uh, tramping around and I got to see bird movements and I picked up on a few things going on in my own backyard that, that, I, that I hadn't even noticed before. So uh -huh. every, every day is an opportunity for discovery and um, I'm going to be doing more of that. Well, I hope you enjoy every moment of it. You do have some travel on the horizon. You will be in Bozeman for an event with Conrad Anker at the Emerson Center on the 16th. Tickets are available. And for listeners as well, check out Life Lived Wild. It's on shelves now, both actual and virtual. Buy it on an actual shelf. You know, go out there to an actual bookstore and get your copy. Rick, it's been a pleasure uh, reconnecting with you, learning more about your work and your sensibility. And yeah, I encourage everybody to um, not only read your latest book, but uh, get more in touch with your work because it's, it's a message that, uh, that folks need to hear. Well, it was my pleasure, Justin. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening to A New Angle. We really appreciate it. And we're coming to you from Studio 49, a generous gift from University of Montana alums Michelle and Lauren Hansen. A New Angle is presented by First Security Bank, Blackfoot Communications, and the University of Montana College of Business. With additional support from Consolidated Electrical Distributors, Drum Coffee, and Montana Public Radio. AJ Williams is our producer, BTO, Jeff Ament, and John Wicks made our music. Editing by Nick Mott. And Jeff Meese is our master of all things sound. Thanks a lot, and see you next time.